Okay, today's lesson is a bit of a, a pull it all together with one new concept layered on. So the very first thing we're going to do here is discuss the definite integral. And the definite integral is different from the indefinite integral, which involves a plus C and is the general antiderivative. The definite integral is the actual net signed area bound by the function and the x-axis. So this is like what you uh, learned about when you did integration using known geometric shapes and you signed part of it positive if it was above the x-axis and negative if it was below the x-axis. Well, with known geometric shapes, you needed to be able to graph the function and use geometric shapes. But as we know, not all curves are conducive to this. Anything that doesn't have line segments or a semicircle or something that is a known geometric shape can't um, be the definite integral cannot be calculated using known geometric shapes. So we need a workaround. So we use the FTC. This is part one that we're using. And if you notice here, we have restated the FTC for you. That's this right here that the definite integral of the function little f from a to b is the exact same thing as the total change on its antiderivative, meaning big F of b minus big F of a. We can use this to evaluate the definite integral of any function for which we can find the antiderivative. Um, we could do this by hand. So here they're saying, let's integrate from two to four the equation two x, and then of course the dx gives it the width. So what we're going to do first is take little f, which is equal to two x, and we integrate it to big F of x equals x squared. And then of course we use our such that situation we'd say such that we are integrating or we are evaluating from two to four. And that's what's happening here. We're evaluating x squared at four, which is 16. We're subtracting out x squared evaluated at two, which is of course four. So the definite integral or the net signed area bound by the function and the x-axis is 12. So we can do that for each of these examples. And I'll do one more with you and then, uh, I'll have you work, pause the video, work on your own, and then come back to check your answers. So 3x squared is going to integrate to x cubed by reversing the power rule. And of course, I will evaluate this from negative 1 to 2. I first put in 2, and 2 cubed is 8. And then I subtract out negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1. So I have 8 minus a negative 1, which is 9. Now please go ahead and attempt these on your own. Hit pause and come back in a moment to check your, or come back when you're done to check your answers. All right, let's take a look at our responses. Secant squared, as we have memorized by now, integrates to tangent x. And so I'm evaluating tangent first at pi over four, which is one, and then at zero, which is zero. So this answer is one. X integrates to x squared over two. Evaluate that first at 6 and then at negative 2 and subtract and you get at 16. Negative 1 over x squared integrates to positive 1 over x. And then I'm going to evaluate that first at 4 and then at 2. So I have 1 fourth minus 1 half, which is negative 1 fourth. 4e to the x integrates to itself. And I evaluate that first at the ln of 7 and then at the ln of 3. Recall that when you have e raised to the ln, you are composing inverses. So the e and the ln cancel, and you're left with 4 times 7 minus 4 times 3. So 28 minus 12 is 16. 1 half, 1 over 2 rad x integrates to just the square root of x. So I have the square root of 16 minus the square root of 4, which gives me 2. Recall that one over x integrates to the natural log of the absolute value of x, and I evaluate first at e and then at one. Once I plug in my e and my one, which are both positive, I can eliminate the absolute values. They're no longer needed. ln of e is one, and ln of, ln of one is zero, so the answer here is one. For number eight, when we integrate one over t cubed, we go up a degree to um, a negative two as our degree, and we divide by the negative two. So we get negative one over two t squared. And when we evaluate that first at five, we get negative one fiftieth. And then we subtract out evaluating at one, which is negative one half. So negative one fiftieth minus a negative one half gets us 24 fiftieths, which simplifies to 12 twenty fifths. And then finally, with the absolute value, you do not integrate this one algebraically. This one, you're going to use known geometric shapes. And you see I've sketched it out and shaded in the appropriate sections. If you were to have tried to integrate, most of you probably thought this went to x squared over two. 
and then evaluate it at one and negative two, that's when you get the negative three halves. You cannot do that because this is really a piecewise function where y equals x if x is, say, greater than or equal to zero, and y equals negative x if x is less than zero. So you'd actually have to, if you were to do this algebraically, split this into a piecewise and evaluate x from zero to one, or the integral of x from zero to one, and the integral of negative x from negative two to zero. That takes a lot more effort, so we just usually default to doing absolute value integration using known geometric shapes. And I just wanna point out for all of these, these were the definite integral, so your answers for all were a number, the net signed area bound by the function and the x-axis.